at 605, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, people still have a few minutes to join us because I'm going to talk briefly um, just about creative experience. Um, always doing a shameless plug for um, my department here at the library. Um, so if you're not familiar with creative experience, creative experience is a digital makerspace. Um, so we have two soon to be three locations um, at our um, library system here in the city. So the two locations that are already established are Central Library on Olive and Bar Library at Jefferson and 44. And soon it will be Julia Davis Library on Natural Bridge. Um, and Creative Experience um, has so many things. We have crickets, we have 3D printers, we have laser cutters, we have large format printers, we have recording studios, um, and we also have um, computers that just have all types of creative software, um, including the full Adobe suite, um, graphic design, um, video game design, virtual reality creating, um, so many things. Anything you can think of, you can do it in our spaces, and all you need is a library card. Um, we do um, workshops all month long, including workshops that are virtual like this. Um, this is less of an arts and craft workshop, which is what we normally do. Um, so it's a little bit off the beaten path of the type of workshops that we do in Creative Experience. Um, but for example, this morning I did a workshop um, for 3D printing bookmarks, which is really fun. Um, and so we were able to customize their own bookmarks and they were able to learn about 3D modeling. Um, so if there's something that you're interested in using, um, to make just personal crafts, maybe for a wedding, bridal shower, baby shower, or even for your small business. We do have small business owners that use our large format printing services to print food truck menus, to print um, window clings for their storefronts, to um, reproduce their artwork to sell, because we do have canvas paper, so you can reproduce your canvas prints to be able to sell. Um, and all you need is a library card. Um, the pricing is really affordable and we do give so much away for free, um, including um, for like large form printing, we get four feet away for free um, each month. Um, and then after that, it's just going to vary on the paper type, how much it costs. Um, so let me know if you have any questions. Um, you can always email me um, or you can come into our spaces to learn about the services that we have available and to be able to get a library card. Um, we make it very, very easy to get a library card because we want everyone to be able to have access. Um, so that's just my shameless plug for creative experience um, and for the library in general. Um, thank you so much for supporting and to coming to these workshops. And even if you're watching this on YouTube um, for supporting the things that we do, um, because with a program like this, we're highlighting local artists um, because we want to be able to give them a platform. We have a really great arts and culture scene here in St. Louis, and there's so many artists out there. And with the series, this is, I believe, the fifth one that we've done. We've been able to um, highlight different artists for each of them, um, which is a really, really great thing um, because so many of the people who have attended these have said that they had no idea who these artists were and they've been able to now have contact and be able to go see their shows or be able to buy their art. Um, so thank you so much for supporting and thank you so much for um, our panelists here for donating your time to be here um, and be able to share your thoughts with us. We really appreciate it. Um, so now I will hand it over to our panelists to introduce themselves. Um, I told them earlier they could decide amongst themselves who wants to go first because nobody ever really wants to be the first person. Um, but if no one knows who wants to go first, um, I guess I could choose. But I don't want to do that to, <laughs> to you guys to make you choose. Does anyone want to go first? This is always the hard part, right? <laughs> All right, well, I'm not shy about talking, so I'll just get the ball rolling. Um, my name is Alex John Meyer. I've been an artist my entire life, but I've been pursuing it professionally for the last 15 years. I'm one of the co-founders of the Metro Trans Umbrella Group. I was the events director, and but most importantly, in my opinion, I was the creator of MTUG's annual LGBT art exhibition entitled Transcending the Spectrum. I ran that exhibition for nine years. So I just stepped down from all MTUG related responsibilities two months ago to be able to focus 100% of all of my time, effort, and emotional uh, energy into my art career. So I have a uh, solo art show coming in two years. And that is the only thing that I'll be working on from now until then. Now I'm unmuted. And um, I have a video that Alex um, sent to me that I will share with you all right now. Okay. 
the dollar sign right next to me. I'm a professional artist working in watercolor and acrylic now. When you turn it up. But honestly, I've been painting since middle school, high school. <laughs> Most people would describe my work as realism. Um, and I would say I agree with that. I, I most enjoy painting still lifes and evoking emotions using iconic imagery and uh, symbolism. So the themes that I like to explore in my paintings are LGBT issues, but specifically the unity and the division that occurs within our communities, not just the LGBT community. Um, other themes that really speak to me are finding beauty in the broken, and recalling a sense of nostalgia and um, connecting with other people on our shared childhood memories. I find that um, still lifes mm -hmm. are a way to connect with other people through objects because we as humans, we all own or identify or have memories of objects and your personal experiences or memories of that object may be different than mine. But um, for example, Oh, sorry, everyone. I'm going to try to reshare to see if maybe I just wasn't sharing audio. I did a painting of some roller skating. There we go. And Can we start over? Very yes. fond memories. Um, sorry about that. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hi, my name is Alex John Meyer. I'm a professional artist working in watercolor and acrylics now for about 15 years. But honestly, I've been painting since middle school, high school. <laughs> Most people would describe my work as realism, um, and I would say I agree with that. I, I most enjoy painting still lifes and evoking emotions using iconic imagery and uh, symbolism. So the themes that I like to explore in my paintings are LGBT issues, but specifically the unity and the division that occurs within our communities, not just the LGBT community. Um, other themes that really speak to me are finding beauty in the broken and recalling a sense of nostalgia and um, connecting with other people on our shared childhood memories. I find that um, still lifes are a way to connect with other people through objects because we as humans, we all own or identify or have memories of objects and you're personal experiences or memories of that object may be different than mine. But um, for example, I did a painting of some roller skates and I have very fond memories um, going roller skating with my friends in the 80s and early 90s. Um, and But now even my daughter is 15 years old and she has memories of going roller skating with her friends when she was in middle school and high school. So. Through my work, I like to think that I'm sharing the struggles and the celebrations of life that connect us all on a human level. Thanks so much for uh, listening. And now I'd like to share with you some of my completed paintings. Bye. The first painting I'd like to talk about is an acrylic I created quite a few years ago called Different From Us. This painting is about bigotry within the LGBT community, but also within America regarding people of color. So in this painting, the primary colors have pushed down the secondary color. So the red Candyland man has pushed down the green one, but the yellow and blue one are doing nothing to help him back up. And so to me, what this painting represents is the division or bullying or mistreatment, um, that the separation that occurs within any community. The last painting I'd like to talk about is an acrylic that I created in honor of my father-in-law who passed away. All of my paintings are based upon my own photography. And when the day I took this photo, I, I found this rusty old bike in this abandoned barn. And I loved the way it was covered in dust and leaning against the side wall of the barn. It seemed to me that the bike was looking out the window, longing to be outside in the sun again. So to me, this painting represents finding the courage to live one's truth, to, for all of us to find the strength to step into the light, to pursue the things in life that will bring us happiness. 
If you're interested in learning more about the Metro Trans Umbrella Group, you can visit their website, which is stlmetrotrans.org. They have free support groups for transgender men and women and non-binary people, a free clothing closet, and a free food pantry. To learn more about me and my work, you can visit my website, which is alexjohnmeyer.com. I have my work available at Artisans in the Loop Gallery on Delmar and my Etsy shop. Alex, was there anything else you wanted to add? Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Um, does anyone else like to volunteer to go next? Um, I can I can go. <laughs> I can go. Um, is there a way that I can uh, share my screen? Am I? Can I just? I think I can do that. I'm bad with technology. Co-host, I think you should be able to. Okay. Let's see. Um, it says, oh, wait, hold on, let me see. Okay. Let's see. Oh, God. Okay. I'm Janie, by the way. Let's see if I can. Okay, wow. Um, all right. So I'm just going to do like a little brief talk as I show you about 9 million images. Uh, you can ask questions later. Da, 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 da. Okay. So, oops. Oh, God. All right. Hold on. Sorry. I've already messed this up. Okay. I'm just going to do it this way because I'm having troubles. Anyways, my name is Janie Stam. Um, I'm an artist currently living in St. Louis. Um, I'm originally from South Florida. I was born um, on Miami Beach and then raised in the suburbs. Let me see if I can do presentation view. I'm so sorry. There we go. Finally. Okay. So this, uh, that's me with a sculpture I made with a real live alligator. I went swimming with an alligator once. Most amazing experience of my life. We can cover that later as well. Um, this is uh, one of my pieces out in the Everglades. So a lot of my work primarily focuses on exploring Floridian queer identity um, in the face of climate change. So I like to take things that involve both the environment and queer history um, and combine them into like a delicate form uh, as a way to preserve them in the face of climate change. So where I'm originally from in South Florida is one of the most vulnerable areas. I grew up kind of inward from the Atlantic Ocean, but on the edge of the Everglades. Um, and Florida rests on top of a giant aquifer. So all the water that comes in with uh, rising sea levels, if it doesn't have anywhere to go inside of the aquifer, which basically acts as a water filtration system, it gets pushed up. Um, so over the course of my lifetime and all of our lifetimes, we're going to watch as sea level rise progresses. Um, and with that, it will start to creep inward and remove these places that are very near and dear to my heart, but also hold invaluable memories um, and histories that don't often get shared, especially those involving queer people and those involving vulnerable populations like animals and plants. Um, so I just like to explore how I can make things that are in the realm of Floridian identity, referencing souvenirs, tourism, things that are exciting, colorful, things that'll draw you in texturally, but then when you look at them, they really have these heavier meanings behind them. So I primarily do beadwork right now um, with embroidery. I'm currently an artist in residence at the Craft Alliance here in St. Louis, and I'm scrambling for my life to get ready for our big exhibition next month, which opens, I believe, July 8th or 9th. And I think there's a reception later that month, which I highly recommend everyone coming to if you'd like to meet me in person. Um, but now I'll just kind of let the work speak for itself. Um, and by that, I mean, I'm going to jump in right now. So this is actually pretty timely for this uh, panel that we're doing. This is a piece that I made. Um, it's a quilt 
in memorial of the people who were killed, the 49 people who were killed at Pulse nightclub in 2016. Um, so each empty shell represents a person who was killed that night. Um, and I believe this weekend was the six year anniversary uh, since that happened. Um, so I traveled down to Orlando. Uh, I visited the memorial, I believe it was the first week after the shooting happened and then a couple years later. And then every time I go back to Florida, if I'm driving, I make sure to stop by. Um, but this is all hand sewn um, and hand beaded as well. Oops, sorry. And this piece will actually be on display uh, at Dwayne Reed Gallery in the Central West End starting June 24th. And then these are two catalysts kind of to my work. I highly recommend everybody, if you have time, look into Anita Bryant. She managed to strike down landmark legislation in 1977 in Miami-Dade County that would have protected LGBTQ workers. Um, and then there's this purple image on the other side called Homosexuality and Citizenship in Florida. It's a propaganda pamphlet that was published by the state in 1964 that is eerily similar to what's going on right now with Don't Say Gay, where it primarily targeted people who worked for the state and queer uh, teachers. And uh, this is one of my favorite artists, so I just wanted to throw him out there. He has an amazing show in Chicago right now, but I will pass the floor back over. Let's see. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and for all of our artists, if you do want to drop um, your like Instagram or website in um, the chat, you can do that as well. Um, uh, but you just want to make sure you change your chat to like everyone or else you'll just be sending it to us, which we want to see it too, but if you send it to everyone, we'll all see it. Um, so who would like to go next? Maxi, okay. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Maxi um, and I'm an artist and that's my presentation. No, um, okay. So everyone has like really good slideshows and videos. Um, I'm just gonna show you my website. It's kind of cool. I designed it myself and all the art on it is mine. Let's see. I was actually doing some HTML coding while we were <laughs> in the Zoom meeting. So we're just gonna go to maxglamour.com. That's where you can find me. Um, so I'm an artist and let's go to the art page because that's where the art is. Um, I, I make costumes and makeup and photograph things. Um, I work with people all over the world to create these fantastic surrealistic um, dreamscapes. Um, my art really just kind of focuses on demons and monsters. Um, it's, this is all me. And um, this one I did for an event about drugs, um, just to kind of highlight about addiction and drug use within the community. Um, I made this out of a whole bunch of different um, pill containers, maybe like 60 of them. Um, this one I made out of a plate. Uh, I just made prosthetics out of a plastic bag and a plate because I needed a new look. And I don't know if you can see my mouse, um, but the teeth and all of that is from a plate. Um, and then I do self-portraits because I don't know, sometimes photographers don't capture you like the way you want to be captured. So I just do stuff like this. It's makeup, it's costumes. Um, and I also make music and perform. Mm, maybe I'll show you, maybe I'll show you this, a little snippet of this because I don't think I'm as prepared as everyone else, but this is a short little video. Oh, should I share sound? Let me do that. Okay, share sound. This is an act that I did. All of my acts, all the costumes and makeup and everything that I do, that all comes together in these acts that I create to my own music. A lot of it is about absurdism, liberation, anti-capitalism, socialism, 
I'm definitely a Marxist uh, and I love that commie art stuff. So here you go. Maybe. <laughs> take too much time but that is an act you can see more of it online i tour all over um a lot of times i just play the flute and make songs about rejection but yeah that's that awesome thank you so much josie matthew josie okay yeah, I'll go. Uh, I also am not as prepared, I feel like, but uh, that was really good, all of you. Um, my name's Josie Camerata. I'm an elementary art teacher uh, here in St. Louis. I've been here for 13 years, but I'm originally from New Orleans. So, um, Janie, Janie, right? Did I get your name? Okay. Um, yeah, your, uh, your whole presentation definitely hit home for me as well. Uh, even though I've never lived in Florida, New Orleans is very similar. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, so uh, I'm on my summer break right now. So my teacher brain is, of course, uh, I don't know, somehow amazed that I still have a bunch of stuff to do. Uh, but I do have my website up um, and my Etsy. So I'll go ahead and share that with you guys and chat a little bit. It's not what I wanted to do. I want to do this. All right. There we go. Uh, okay, so. Can everybody see my, oh, perfect, let me make this big. All right, so um, this is my uh, website, The Pigeonhole. It's a, it's a Wix site. I could probably update one day, but just haven't done it yet. Um, but either way, I've got my artwork from all the way from high school to uh, recent. I actually spent a good portion of today updating it finally, because uh, I hadn't updated it since 2020 uh, for whatever reason. So um, some of the things that I really enjoy doing are painting uh, animals, uh, birds, whenever I get to choose what I wanna paint and um, pet portraits for people as commissions. And I have a uh, 2018 up here because <clears throat> that's pretty much when my pet portraits, like the way that I'm doing them now started uh, actually with Mao House's cat art fair. Um, so I really love to do art fairs around the city um, and Mau House, of course, is a really fun one because uh, I love cats and have two of my own. Um, but anyway, uh, so I like to do those commissions, but some other ones I've done for like Art of Paws, 
um, have mostly all been birds and then wall ball as well. I've done that four times now. And um, uh, I've also done birds for all the wall ball paintings. So this one here is one of the ones I did in 2018 called King Q. So uh, he was a peacock that I saw in London at Kew Gardens and took a picture of him and was like, I'm gonna make this into a painting. So I like to work from photos as well. Um, this one is not from any special event. This is one of the rare ones I just did for myself of a really sassy chicken. Um, and I still have this original one. And then this is a, another sassy one actually from one of the birds at the World Bird Sanctuary uh, here in St. Louis, which I like to paint birds from, from there as much as I can. This is Chris. He is the only bird of his type in North America. I forgot what he is exactly. I think it's like a crested something eagle. Anyway, he's real special. Um, but uh, so I've got that. Let me go to some more recent ones. Um, so this is from 2019. Uh, I did this one for Art of Pause uh, in 2019 of a lion, which I named Malia. Kind of had in mind like, uh, to, I think I forgot what it meant, but I also had in mind Malia Obama. <laughs> um, but I just thought that name fit. Uh, let's go and see. This one is my favorite little guy, uh, Oliver. He's also from the World Bird Sanctuary. Um, so a lot of my art, it doesn't necessarily have to do with um, LGBTQ themes like in particular, but it always has to have humor and some kind of funkiness to it. And my goal is to make people smile or laugh in some way. Um, but Sir Steve here was actually for M Tug's uh, show in 2019. And I was actually shocked that he sold that night too, <laughs> which doesn't happen for me often since I mostly do commissions. Uh, so that was exciting. And my mom loves Sir Steve. She's, I think she loves his name. I don't know why I named him that, but uh, I decided to kind of take a real picture of a fancy chicken because I like to paint fancy pigeons and chickens. I also am kind of appalled by the fact that they exist, but I find them really interesting to paint. Uh, so I just made this chicken like a make-believe rainbow chicken, but it's also not completely make-believe. So anyway, that's Sir Steve. Um, let's see, I've got some other things. I've got something to do with uh, Florida here. If Janie wanted to look, I did this as the commission for a family member. <laughs> and it's just got like places for, I think it was from Miami, not sure. Um, Anyway, uh, this is the one that Alex wanted me to show that I painted of my cat Moose that you may have seen at the beginning, um, staring over the edge of the, the board. He and my cat Mango from this, uh, yeah, from this one, they accompany me at all my art shows as commission examples. And then this was my cat Misha, who also is very sassy in that picture. Um, okay, moving on. So 2020 was very, eventful for me to make paintings. Um, so I'll just kind of show you a little bit of this. Here's another Art of Pause one uh, for 2020, Sun Swallow, another bird. Uh, so that was a fun one. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> and uh, yeah, some other pets peeking over. And I like to have fun with the backgrounds, um, but I just really like doing faces. There's an orangutan in there as well. This was for a friend who has adopted an orangutan from afar. This orangutan doesn't have arms, by the way. Just a random fun fact for you. Um, 2021, uh, I've got some more commissions. This one was a fabulous Mardi Gras themed cat that I did for another family friend. Look, we've got another cat on the screen there with Maxi. <laughs> Love it. Um, this was actually one for uh, the last MTUG show last year of my friend Kamiko that also was in the LGBTQ plus uh, community and passed away in 2020, um, had moved away in 2018 from St. Louis, um, but I didn't realize that she had passed away until six months after uh, because of only having like one mutual friend. Um, so that just wasn't popping up on like my social media feed. And so that was really uh, hard for me to learn. And then I decided to put that, you know, emotion and try to get her personality and her dog's personality who was still alive um, into the painting. And the back, like I had this, this is actually kind of a fun little story. Uh, the piece of wood that I painted it on, um, I picked up off the street in New York 
in Manhattan in like 2016. I don't know why I put it in my suitcase because uh, my friends and I were like, scrap wood. We're like, yeah, scrap wood, but I'm in New York. What am I going to do with this? But I took it anyway and I put it in my suitcase and then didn't paint on it until five years later and decided that Kamiko needed to go onto this piece of wood and that I didn't need to finish the background because it just kind of represented her unfinished life. Um, and that I couldn't decide on what to put up there. So I was like, this is, this is it, this is what it is. So that one really meant a lot to me. Um, but to bring things, oh, I have two, well, two more on this page I wanna show you. This one is from Art of Pause this year. And I liked it so much, I almost wanted to keep it and not submit it. And instead I made a print of it because it's three feet by three feet. And I made a print of it like 20 inches by 20 inches and put it in my bedroom because three of the cats were mine. This is Mango, this is Moose, and then that's my cat Misha that passed away. Uh, so that one's really special. And then this is just um, a little political satire, which I don't do much of, but I always have ideas. And I was doing a project with my students, which I teach elementary, just a reminder there. So I didn't show them this. Um, I was <laughs> teaching my students and uh, we were doing Hokusai's Great, Hokusai's Great Wave as kind of like a, you know, beginning of the year change kind of thing. And then I started sketching one out and then it turned into this. And I was like, I'm gonna just take this home and work on it there. And I'm gonna create another example for them. <laughs> like, so, uh, so that's what I did with that. Um, and then I'll just show you the most recent ones and move on and quickly show you my Etsy and then I'll be done. Um, so here's some more recent ones. This is my most recent wall ball painting, Blossom. Blossom is a rescue chicken. Uh, so I like to do birds from like rescue places, I guess. Um, but I've had two chicken dates with Blossom now. So Blossom and I are total buddies, just saying. Um, all right, so there's that. And then I have my Etsy. I'll put the links in the chat in just a bit. My Etsy is from my fruit earrings. So total different little shift there uh, to some weird earrings. So there are fruit and vegetables and other things coated in resin and and this is kind of just what I have available right now. My blood oranges are my faves. Um, and then I have my, my pet portrait commissions on Etsy as well for anybody who wants to get it from there. So this is just a fun part about like being able to reach people from uh, around the country. Okay, that's all I've got to say. <laughs> awesome, thank you. And Matthew, last but not least. Okay, let me uh, share screen. Everybody else had visual aid, so I went and pulled up an old slideshow. So I had something to share. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Matthew R. Kearns. I am the president and artistic director of St. Louis Fringe. Uh, Fringe is an 11 year old arts organization. We're a producing, uh, creating, and presenting organization. Most people know us for our uh, annual festival that happens in August, uh, this year, August 15th through 21st, and we have a myriad of multidisciplinary acts that we present, some we create. This year there are 47 of them, so please do check out our website at sdlfringe.org. I'll put that in the chat. Um, we also uh, produce throughout the year. We just finished uh, creating uh, a new play for St. Louis called An Act of God, which is by David Jabberbaum. Uh, David Jabberbaum is the um, was the head writer for uh, John Stewart on The Daily Show for years. And he created a Twitter account where he played God. And then he just decided to turn that Twitter account into a play uh, where God comes back and habits the body of a gay man, me, and uh, comes back to tell the new version of the Ten Commandments because uh, we've messed them up and he feels like he needs to leave a new one before he uh, lets us go. It's a really funny show. And uh, we've been really lucky to bring it to our uh, Friends in St. Louis as part of our Pride series. Um, other things about me, uh, I speak a lot. I have a TED talk out there about the value of community. Uh, and I also uh, just spoke recently at what they call the World Fringe Congress, which is all the fringes from around the world coming together to uh, talk about our worlds. Um, I'm also a performance artist. I have a friend, I was thinking about these things as everyone was talking. I have a friend for years who said that my art making not is always a little bit of truth telling. And uh, I think that that's probably true of me. The picture that you see on the screen uh, is me with a deer head. That deer head was my father's. This is a show called Home that I made that was about my father's sudden and, sudden and untimely death. He was a hunter. I was not. 
he was a fisherman, I was not. Um, and we found happiness with each other through all of our differences. Uh, straight dad, gay kid, um, which I'm really proud of. Uh, this is a show that I produced uh, through the French Festival. Um, this is Jose Amaya. Uh, this collect collective of people came together. They're a college, uh, they were college friends. Part of these friends, because this is uh, from a university uh, down on the border uh, of Texas and Mexico. So half of the kids are from Texas and half are from Mexico. And they came together to talk about uh, the struggles of living in this area and specifically the, the these two towns are pretty uh pretty bad with gang related activity uh and they're where some of the biggest drug cartels happen and they came and they've been sharing the story around the country and it's really beautiful and it's a piece of work that i'm really proud that the fringe has presented and it continues to live on um these two pieces of work <laughs> that's a meme with bernie sanders in it which is funny uh, but this is Siobhan Laughlin. In 2014, Joan Lipkin and I uh, produced this show as a premiere in St. Louis. It's called Broken Bone Bathtub. That's Siobhan Laughlin in the tub. And she traveled the world, uh, literally every single piece of the world, telling this story of how she broke her arm to a tale of people in front of her in a bathroom, usually. This is in a really cool uh, performance loft that we found. But usually she has about six people in the bathroom. And she tells the entire story and it's interactive. And what happens is she starts questioning back the audience, asking them if they've ever had fear, if they've ever been in surgery, if they've ever felt vulnerable. And the evening turns into this beautiful evening of sharing uh, throughout the entire community uh, that's representative of the artist and, uh, and the patrons of the room. And it's a very, very pointed piece of work. Someone that she asked someone to wash her hair at one point because she can't do it because of the cast. It's really pretty spectacular. Uh, and the photo next to this is certainly uh, for color girls who considered suicide when the rainbow was enough. I was privileged enough to choreograph this show uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, really, it was just probably one of the most powerful experiences of my uh, choreography life. Let's see, uh, this is interesting. So on the left here is a show called In the Tank. It's a short one act play. I was supposed to direct something else and I ended up directing this because of the pandemic for the college that I teach at. And we had to direct it in a way where we shot everybody miles apart from each other on screens that you see here uh, because uh, we couldn't be close to each other. So they were all face masked and plastic masked and everything else and then we took them back to the uh, we did the play like this, we put the editing studio, we mashed them up. So if you see the finished product, they actually look like they're next to each other. And it's about two lobsters in a restaurant aquarium on a Friday night. And they're worried about, one is worried about being eaten, the other is like, this is my legacy, I have to do it, it's my destiny. Uh, yeah. And then as I said, I'm a performance artist too. So uh, this is my uh, rendition of Melania Trump. Uh, during the Mueller report, there was a reading of uh, the Mueller report by artists and I decided that, uh, I, I don't ever wanna be that other one, but I thought it might be interesting if Melania came in and had a few things to say about it. So I created some kind of what I call busted Melania and uh, she got so much attention that she ended up in uh, American Theater Magazine. So that's a little bit about my world. Let me uh, get myself out of here. Let's do this, let's end that. Dun, dun, dun. Let's not save, let's stop sharing. I guess the other thing to tell you about me that is probably well, my favorite, most interesting thing about my life is I married the love of my life a few years ago in a simple pandemic ceremony underneath the arch. Uh, and uh, yeah, and ended up in the New York Times, our wedding, because it was one of the first gay COVID weddings out there in the country, apparently. <laughs> uh, that's me. Oh, and I, I one more thing. I just finished playing God in an act of God. I told you that. Yes. Okay. Good. Now I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing with us. Um, uh, for our attendees, um, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat and you can put them in the uh, Q and A section at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and we will address those um, after all the panel questions have been answered, just so that we would make sure we get through those. Um, but at the end, if we have time for questions and we have any questions, um, you can ask questions just in general to all of our artists, or if you have a question for a specific artist, um, feel free to put it in there. Um, so without further ado, 
we will start with our first um, panel question. Um, and for our panelists, um, if you don't have an answer to the question, don't feel pressured to answer anything. Um, and um, a lot of times there's kind of a mute, unmute, who's gonna go first kind of thing. Um, so whoever unmutes first can go ahead and, and start our, um, our uh, answering off. Um, so our first question here that I'll read, um, so there's a quote that I've read that said, to be visibly queer is to choose happiness over safety. Do you agree with that statement? And do you incorporate or include aspects of your identity and your work with intention? And do you feel an obligation to do so? So it's a very multi-part question. I can repeat it as many times as we need, um, but who would ever like to start off? I'm actually going to start. I don't, I don't feel like I have to, it's not a choice because I want to, it's a choice because I am. And I am very proud and very open. And when I came out of the closet in the very early 90s, uh, I made a vow to myself to not go back in for anyone, not a job, not a person, not anything. And it has not always been easy, but it is the best decision that I ever made. And I like to tell people that my husband and I are as boring as the straight people that live next door. And that's what I worked very hard and fought very hard to make sure that we are just as normalized as the Joneses, as they say. Um, I'll, I'll follow up to that. I think it's a really important, especially if you're existing in the world, carrying certain privileges that other people don't have. Um, as like a white cis queer person, um, I think visibility is really important, but also not just like personal visibility, but using your power to give those who don't often get that same visibility, the platform to do so, even if it means like pushing yourself aside. Um, when I, I came out when I was 24 and I feel like I never really had any queer people around me growing up, or at least people that I didn't know were queer. I didn't know what to look for. And I never really saw any reflections of myself um, until I moved to Chicago. And I feel like everyone in Chicago is very queer, very open. So I feel like I landed in this like ultra radical community and felt really lucky and confident. And then I moved to St. Louis for grad school. And I was like, oh my God, gay art school, it's gonna be great. And then I was one of just like a couple of queer people and having to essentially like build that community within my program and educate my peers of how to like, let's talk about this in as least non-problematic way as possible um, while dispersing information that may seem like a lot. Um, yeah. Um. So yeah, I feel like, you know, being black and queer, sometimes we have to look at individual identities and how we're navigating spaces. And I think that sometimes within white black spaces, um, I think that the connecting factor is in my queerness, you know, the connecting factor of my art is like liberation of white supremacy, they're, they're, they're connected. Um, and sometimes I think that my art really touches on particular subjects and the palatability of particular like viewers of that. Um, and I don't always like make my art like, I wanna say it not overtly queer, but like, you know, it's very gay. Um, it's really gay, um, but I won't, I won't put up rainbows up there. You know, like my queerness isn't like, you know, I don't want my queerness to be normalized. I feel like I want, you know, my art to be a little bit subversive and kind of like combat things and yeah. I'll go. Um, so I'm uh, I'm not great at like thinking off the top of my head. Uh, I just to be completely honest with everyone, I discovered that I have a brain injury, um, and so I have a harder time um, comprehending questions and then remembering what I want to say. So I'm going to be reading what I'm going to be saying. Um, so y'all know why I'm not looking here. I'm looking down here. Um, I came out as bisexual when I was 17 years old and my partner and I have been together since we were 15 years old and so when I came out to him as bi he's like yep that makes sense and then when I came out to him as trans when I was 33 he's like yep that makes sense so I've been out as a trans queer man collectively you know for I've been out for for about 10 years now um so choosing to be visible um 
wasn't a choice for me. It was more about living authentically. Um, I wanted to represent myself and my community. And that's part of why I was motivated to want to create MTUG with Sarah Johnson all those years ago was to represent myself authentically and my community. Because for most of my cisgender friends, I'm the first trans person they ever met. Um, and that came with a lot of responsibility. Um, and so, yes, my my life and my work is blatantly trans and queer because I don't feel like I have a choice. And I can say that I have effectively made a difference in the lives of not just the trans and queer people in my life, but I feel I have positively affected and changed the minds and educated a lot of cis and straight people in my life and in our community at large. Um, so I do incorporate LGBT themes into my work. Um, the piece behind me is a really good example of that. Um, I, this piece specifically is about how uh, inanimate objects are often more respected as male or female than actual trans humans and non-binary people. Um, and so you look at these mannequins and they, because they're wearing dresses and pearls, they're perceived as female. Um, but to me, like objects don't inherently have gender and yet trans women and non-binary people have to fight so I almost said a curse word, have to fight so hard to be respected for their, you know, identities. Um, so yes, a lot of my work is about LGBT issues. Um, and I blatantly spill rainbows all over everything. And I, I do not apologize for that. Um, so a lot of my work, uh, for example, I did a painting about um, when Domo was overturned. And so it's a box of crayons and all of the colors of the rainbow and black and brown and the trans colors are all together. Um, because uh, most people look at my work and just think it's just happy, innocent crap. And actually all of my paintings are like deep with symbolism and colors aren't just colors to me. Colors represent feelings and um, nothing is ever it seems with me because I feel like as trans and queer people, you can't take us at face value. There's so much more under the surface. Josie, did you have anything you wanted to add or anyone else have anything you want to add? Um, I don't have a lot on this question. Uh, when I look at the questions, I have more to say about the latter half. Um, just, I think I'm still trying to figure it all out. I also kind of, I guess I technically have not publicly come out, but I kind of have, but I've also been like, I kind of, well, yeah, Alex is, yeah, shaking her head. <laughs> um, so I'm, uh, I guess I'm kind of just figuring out like what my identity is with my art like that, because, so I don't have a whole lot to elaborate on right now. I guess the one thing I'll just throw in there that I somehow didn't, is most of the art that I've made throughout my career is all themed around some kind of social activism around the LGBTQIA movement and uh, pushing pushing normalcy, pushing uh, equality, pushing equal rights, pushing marriage for a very long time, um, which is interesting because I was never somebody who wanted to get married and that I ended up fighting for it more than I probably ever thought I would have. And then I got married, so that's weird, uh, but yeah. Awesome, any other thoughts on this question? Um, I just wanted to add, like, a lot of my art, it does kind of talk about, like, these issues, but it's really absurd. I like to, like, take you know, oppression and throw it into, like, a fairy tale um, to kind of disconnect from the realist aspect of it and put it in this surrealist world where, like, you know, the taking in oppression, if it's about fairy tales, it's a lot easier than if you're looking at, like, the real life Mitch McConnell's out there. It was not easy to take in. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for sharing. Um, moving on to our second question here. Um, in many ways, LGBTQ persons have had to create their own space, including in the art world. Are there communities like that in St. Louis? 
If so, how have they been positive in your work or career? How can we be more supportive of these organizations and communities? Um, okay, so I'm a drag queen and um, a lot of drag queens are forced to perform in bars. These are like the only spaces in which like queerness was like, acceptable for most of the time. So I found myself in these places where drinking is like you have to or drugs is something that you have to do and like everyone's there to kind of escape. Um, and I think it's kind of beautiful just this underworld culture that's subversive. Um, it, it sucks how sometimes we're forced to be there. I think, you know, what society kind of really needs to do is love, like ease up on us. Um, you know, some of us have our vices. I think a lot of queer people turn to drugs and alcohol in spaces that are, you know, meant for that or meant to kind of escape. Um, I think that billionaires that are straight, they do their cocaine in there, you know, they're they're lost, but then they look at like recreational drug users of like lower like classes as trash, as homeless drug addicts. And I think that, um, you know, really looking at who doesn't have the spaces, doesn't have a multitude of spaces and how they have to cope with the, the, the nastiness of reality. I think that if the people in power kind of were more compassionate towards those that need escape, I think that we would have um, better and safer spaces that aren't just subjected to bars and, and whatnot. I feel like um, this is completely different than what Maxi just said. I'm in like the visual arts realm um, and like a little more behind the scenes, like fiber arts, whether it's like embroidery or commissions like that. Um, but sometimes I feel like I'm in this weird space of like, I feel like the only queer artist in town, even though I know I'm not, um, I feel like there often aren't spaces where it's like, here's this amazing queer group of artists, which I would love to have if anybody ever wants to join um, or make something. Um, but I feel that the two places that have truly uplifted me and given me power um, as a queer maker in St. Louis in particular, number one is GCAD, Granite City Art and Design District. They let me do some wild stuff and push boundaries um and i just feel so welcomed and loved there plus they have an amazing queer reading series that started last fall called changeling it happens about once every couple three four months or so highly recommend going to it it is beyond world words amazing um but also the contemporary art museum i've had a lot of wonderful teaching opportunities to like interact with all different types of people whether it's people on first fridays mostly adults or like this past spring's uh, quarter i was teaching at sumner high school and i was teaching students how to beadwork and it was absolutely amazing to be able to get in touch with like younger people and see what they're up to and be like hey i'm here I'm queer, blah, blah, blah. Um, so those two places in particular, but I often find myself like connecting with other makers that are queer within the Midwest. There's a ton of us out there and I feel like we're always getting overlooked by the coast, um, but we have a lot of really talented people in this region, so. So I'm really proud that uh, my organization uh, St. Fringe has been pushing the boundaries, and one of our one of our hashtags out there is uh, unleashing voices uh, since 2011. Uh, we opened the doors on the organization, wanting to be the space to offer opportunity where gatekeepers and other arts organizations stop people from creating, stop them from speaking, stop them from presenting, and we wanted to be an opportunity that was uh, diverse and. Uh, possible. So we have we have headline series that are curated, but those are not shows you're going to see uh, in most other sta uh, stages in this region. Uh, we have an invited artist series that specifically focuses on 
stories and works by women, people who identify as disabled, people who identify as LGBTQ, people who identify as person of color, et cetera, et cetera. So it's our, our Invited Artist series is all about elevating diverse voices. And then everything else that we do in our annual festival comes, to, uh, comes from a lottery, a blind lottery where your application is put into a fishbowl and it's pulled out. So you can be a 25 year veteran artist and you have the same opportunity or possibility as somebody who's never presented before in their life. And some of the most beautiful work we've ever seen has come out of that fishbowl. So I'm really proud that we are that organization in the performing arts. Um, yeah, and the way you can support us, because that was part of the question, is certainly if there are people out there who wanna make a donation, donations turn into opportunity for artists um, at stlfringe.org. And you can also come create with us. You can also come with ideas and we can talk about how we start to nurture your artwork and turn it in. We've been working with uh, a couple of friends who were in our third year now of working on an opera and it's getting written um, and it's uh, super exciting. So there, there are all kinds of possibilities for project and development through our organization. And uh, yeah, happy about it. Josie, do you want to go or you want me to go? Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, I was the creator and the curator of the MTUG Art Show uh, for nine years. And um, also I was the events director for MTUG and we had something called Crafternoons at MTUG um, where all of the trans and queer artists could come and we would just be in MTUG's HQ together creating whatever we were working on. We had people who did embroidery, people who did pencil work, people who did, you know, um, like crochet and then we had painters and it was really wonderful. And I'm, I'm hoping that those things will start happening in real life again soon um, now that COVID's getting better. Um, <laughs> I was going to uh, say that, um, Court is a kind of cool thing that Maxi does that definitely provides a space for queer and trans artists. Um, I was very involved helping Maxi put together those shows for a while there before COVID. And it was an honor for me to work with Maxi on that. Um, and it was a lot of fun. And so related to that, but also kind of not, um, I'm a drag king. I haven't performed since Christmas, but drag is absolutely an art and absolutely a creative outlet. And if you want to support uh, some art, some creativity, some expression, go to some freaking drag shows because man, drag performers work and slay and serve just as hard as anyone's showing at the Contemporary Art Museum and within Masters of Fine Art and the Kemper Lane Museum. Like drag is art and dra drag is our history as queer and trans people. So that's just maybe me speaking as a member of that community um, to say how much I love and respect all of my friends and the people that I've gotten to know. It, it is a family. Um, I feel very strongly about drag. And <laughs> and then I guess like the last thing, um, you know, I just, I've been a curator and an events director for multiple nonprofit organizations over the last 12 years. And whether it's spoken word or a dance party, um, I feel like just as LGBTQ plus people, we create our own spaces and it is our responsibility to create those spaces. Whenever I went on vacation last summer to San Diego, they had an LGBT committed art gallery. And I'm like, oh my God, sweet Jesus, could we please have something like that here in St. Louis? And I'm like, but then that voice in my head is like, Alex, that means you need to make that gallery. And I'm like, no, I'm tired. I need a break. <laughs> but I, it's like, sometimes I do think, you know, maybe, Maybe it is up to me and other people to like create our own spaces and to create those opportunities and to create that community. Maybe someday I'll get off my ass and get to that, but you know, we can all work together to make these things happen. Can I just add to what Alex has said? Because uh, my very dear friend, who is now my very unfortunately late friend, Michael Shreves, who was the amazing Michelle McCoslin, uh, passed from COVID and uh, drag is very important. And there was a night at a bar, a 
a long time ago in the early 80s where they were arrested for doing drag because there were still masquerading laws in effect from the 1800s and uh, the ACLU and Michael and a trans artist uh, came together. They came to the cell, the ACLU, and said, we'd like to represent you in this case. And they agreed. It went to court. It was in it a couple of years. And because of those two artists, the laws were changed around masquerading and people were suddenly allowed to wear the clothing that they decided they and chose, decided and chose to wear what they, they chose to wear what they want. It was no longer dictated by law that you had to wear gender specific clothing. Awesome. Thank you everyone for sharing. Um, any other final thoughts before we move on to the next question? Alex? Well, actually I did have one other thing. Yes. Um, there's a Facebook group called Queer Correct Creatives Collective. And um, it's it's like for spoken word, you know, music, uh, yes, visual art, yes, drag. It's like any discipline um, of people. And um, there's been talk of having in-person events again. So I would recommend anyone that's kind of interested and in, like if you're on Facebook, it's the Queer Creatives Collective. Thank you, Alex. Um, now to our third question. Um, do you work in a studio, at home, or wherever you can find a space to work? Do you find having a set studio space advantageous? Why or why not? I'll go first this time. <laughs> um, make up for not answering the last one. Uh, I work at home um, or in my classroom during the school year sometimes, especially at the end of the year when I drag in my commission paintings and the kids are like, what are you doing? And then how do you do that? And I'm like, well, just watch me. And that's the best I got for you. Anyway, um, my dining room is my studio space. When I bought my house, I really wanted a designated studio space, but um, that just didn't happen. So once again, my dining room turned into my studio space, um, which is fine. So I do my paintings up here and then downstairs, I do my resining for my earrings in the basement, which is unfinished, which is perfect because I can get resin wherever and it's not a giant ordeal. And I think it's very important to have a designated space to work. It doesn't have to be a studio, which Alex's is amazing, by the way. I absolutely love your studio, which you probably already know, um, but it definitely has to be like a comfortable spot. Um, I can go. Um, so I have really bad ADHD, so I need a designated work zone. Um, because for the longest time when I would try to make work in my bedroom or anywhere that was like too close to where I can like blob and watch TV, it would be like, oh my God, Netflix. Oh my God, snacks in the fridge, doing laps, talking to the cats, anything but working. So I have a really small studio down in Carondelet. It's in a, like a mixed building with furniture designers um, and two other artists, Krista Valdez and Rachel Laveau. Um, and I have a tiny, I'm currently in my, it's like um, a small room in my house. That's like our, me and my partner's office, but also both of the cat litter boxes are in here. So my time in here is like, you know, the more I spend, I feel like the crazier I go from the poop smell. Um, but right now, for the next couple of weeks, I have another space at the Craft Alliance where I'm learning how to weave. So I've been taking advantage of that. But I think for me personally, it's really important to separate those spaces out. Um, if I can kind of like isolate myself from the things I find like, this sounds sad, but fun, I guess. Um, and like truly view the spaces as like work, work environments. Uh, so my studio is in our house. Uh, when we went to buy, I bought my first house on my own and I bought it specifically because it had a detached basement and I could create an art studio there. And I know that if I have a studio somewhere else, I won't go to it. It's sort of like me and a gym membership. I'll buy a gym membership and I'm never going to use it. So I don't buy them. Um, and the same thing with the studio. I was like, if it's at home, I'll go there. And I do. So when we were looking for a house, it actually took us a very long time to find a house that had a space for me to have a designated art space, which is what I'm in right now. Um, so my studio is up on our third floor. I have the entire attic uh, that's been converted 
and yeah, it's, it's important. It's a gift. I also find the car a great opportunity for me to talk through and think through creative ideas when I'm driving somewhere. I turn things off and I just let my brain think about creative, creating while, while driving safely and uh, at the same time. Uh, do I think it's important? Yes, I do. And I also think that it is the greatest help to me and it is also the ultimate torture because I'm always plagued by the idea of like, you should go up there, that's just sitting there waiting for you. Or if I wanna come up here and like do something like this, it's like, oh, see that thing over there you gotta work on? So it's a little bit of all of the above, but it's all in all a complete and total blessing to be able to have a studio where I can walk straight upstairs and be there when I'm ready to create. Although, um... So similar to Matthew, whenever my husband and I went house hunting 10 years ago, we specifically looked for a property where we could build me a studio. So this was the two car garage. And um, so it was very important to me. I have a child um, that I had a separate entrance for customers to come in and out of my studio or my, you know, my business. Um, too many times uh, my sweet baby child would come in when I was doing a consultation with a customer in practically not, you know, next to nothing um, or say or do something that perhaps I don't want a customer to see or hear. Um, and so having my own separate workspace and uh, for like, and to have customers here, there are three doors between this room and my life and my family. And that separation has been very important to me. Um, but no, yeah, so we, we built my studio um, and then the other half of the garage is our home gym and my husband's office. So he also works from home. And so we are together 24 seven and uh, we love it and we're happy. And having my own room, like Matthew said, is an I am absolutely aware of what a gift and what a privilege that is, because once upon a time when I was in high school and college, you know, um, I did just work in my in my bedroom on the floor, like, you know, I would put down a big piece of cardboard and my mother was terrified. I don't get paint on the rug. And I'm like, I'm sorry. And, <laughs> um, and then when we moved into our first apartment and Patrick and I, that's my husband, when Patrick and I got married and I was working at the kitchen table. And then every time people came over or it was time to eat dinner and I had to put all my crap away. And then I moved into the guest room. And then once my my, my baby child would go to sleep at night. She was sleeping right other the other side of that easel. And so when I was painting too vigorously and that easel would bang up against the wall and wake her up and she would start screaming. And so when this time I'm like, okay, my art studio is on the far opposite end of the house from where we sleep. I can play music. I can make a mess. Um, I'm very thankful for this space. And um, it does, like Matthew said, also create a little bit of an issue because there's not always such a division between my home life and my career because I can just wander in here in my pajamas. So that's like a blessing, but also a curse. And my husband is like, okay, Alex, it's time to stop. Let's, let, we need to go do other things now. Um, but no, I'm thankful to have my, to have this space. Um, okay, so I, I got awarded one of the houses from Art Place, which is like a program in the city to help get housing for low income artists in the city and they're creating like an intentional neighborhood of artists. Um, and within that I have a studio. It's a whole bottom floor. It's a mess. Um, we moved in a month ago. So I focus on the garden and not the studio because of course you like to do the things that don't make you money. Um, but I'm really impulsive. My ADHD kind of works on like stimuli. And so like, I have to be stimulated to be able to focus on art and I'm a full-time artist. So I'll work in the living room whenever I'm watching Buffy at three in the morning, or, you know, I'll get in drag on a train to the gig because it's six hours and I don't have much time or I'll edit videos at the airport. I think being like a multidisciplinary artist, it's kind of hard to have just like a dedicated space for one thing. Um, but in my house, I do technically have that, but, you know, following rules and what should be where isn't really my specialty. Um, that's it. Ooh, 
Awesome, thank you everyone. Any last thoughts on this question? All right, uh, moving on to our fourth question. What would a fulfilling career in your art field look like? And what would it feel like? This is very open-ended. There's not really a right or wrong question to any of these, but especially to this. Okay, I'm gonna go first and be just blatantly honest if y'all haven't figured that out yet. So this is like actually what I've been working with um, my therapist about for like the last few weeks is, um, so I've been a, a you know, full-time artist now for 14 years. Um, and every three years or so, I have like a meeting with myself where I'm like, hello self, we're going to sit down and have a business meeting and we're going to make our goals. And what are your goals? And what are your realistic goals? And then what are your apple pie in the sky dreams kind of goals? And every every step along the way, I've met all of my goals. Last year, I was voted Saint, by St. Louis Magazine's A-list as the best artist of St. Louis. And I have my work in a gallery. And um, the same as Janie, I'm at Dwayne Reed next Friday. And all these things that I dreamed and I hoped would happen someday have now happened, which feels amazing. But it also um, has created panic within me now because I'm very aware that I'm ready to take that next step. And I'm terrified of what that next step is going to be and what it's going to look like and how I'm going to make it happen. Um, I feel I have reached a level in my career of success and it's easy to stay stagnant and to become lazy and to tread water. And to me, that feels like um, failure. And so what I do know is that I wanna to continue to push myself and to move forward. Um, and I'm still working out what that looks like. So success is is such a tricky concept for me as an artist. Um, I guess my apple pie in the sky is to take my work to Chicago and Tennessee and Seattle and Miami and San Francisco. Um, but right now I'm pretty darn happy. And that feels uncomfortable to feel happy if that makes any sense to anybody else it makes a lot of sense to me because i wrestle with a lot of the same things you know we we have the privilege of a studio we have the privilege of you know longer careers with success and i have to tell you it's success has changed with me as i've aged and as i go and ebb and flow throughout my career something that I used to want, I either got it and I didn't want it, or I got it and then it, it helped me evolve into the next place I was supposed to be in. So I think I've learned for sure that I've won awards and that's great, I'm thrilled about them, but that's not why I do what I do. Um, for me, in a post-pandemic life, especially, I'm dreaming of that time where we don't say that word anymore. Um, it's always about education and teaching a next generation how to elevate their voice. That's very important to me. And uh, I will teach until the day that I am not on this planet anymore. Um, creating is important to me. And one of those ways is to not just produce other people's work, but to start producing my own again and to start letting myself be an actor on stage and be vulnerable. It's very difficult work. <laughs> Like being vulnerable in front of strange humor, humans uh, is, is, is a lot of work to like go, here's my heart, stomp on it if you'd like. Um, and the other thing that it, career at this point means to me is to be a leader in this community that's showing the rest of the world how amazing St. Louis is, that's advocating and elevating all of the local artists and it's extending the sector that's going to allow people, everyday people who are way out in the middle of wherever they are, to get to Friday night and go, you know what, do you want to go see that new play that just opened? That's such an important turn that I want to happen in the lives of people that live in this region. 
because that changes the entire world. If they're like, you know what, it's Saturday night, let's go see that drag show. Oh, it's Friday night, let's go see this play. Tomorrow afternoon, do you wanna stop by and see this new gallery opening? It just, if we become a part of their conversation of what their social activity looks like, then, then everybody in the region wins because we end up being a better place for everyone to live, work, and play. You can go first, Maxie. Um, it's probably gonna be really vapid. I wanna be rich and famous. Um, I'm just joking, but actually, you know, I do wanna be rich. I wanna be financially stable. Um, I'm a black queer artist that like lived like with housing instability for a large percentage of my life. Um, and now I'm walking around St. Louis and I can see people wearing clothes that I designed or I go in stores and, um, or I can design something like this resign Lida shirt um, that was actually used to help get Lida to not run again. Um, you know, I think while I am really Marxist, I'm really anti-capitalist, um, I do think having the um, financial stability to be able to be lazy because um, I think laziness is radical. Um, I think a, being able to have that, um, I think for me, that is success. And I like to be lazier, honestly, richer and lazier. <laughs> um, I'm really glad you said that. Uh, yeah, I want to, I want some money. Um, I know that sounds horrible, but it also, I would love to live comfortably as an artist uh, because I feel like there's not a day that goes by where I'm working between two and five jobs. Um, I go, I wake up early to work. I then go to my full-time job and then I come home to work and then I go to bed. Um, I feel like I've spent oddly enough the last like six months really assessing that uh, because I mean, I know this word sounds silly, but I'm a workaholic. I'm currently in therapy for it. Um, I am addicted to working. It is not healthy. It takes a toll on everything in your life, whether it's your relationship or your mental health. Um, I have really intense anxiety um, and I genuinely believe that this leads to it. And I, I don't know, I feel like I've been questioning if making art has been making me happy anymore. So I'm taking just a step back to like reassess what aspects are bringing me joy and making more work that I just find pleasurable, not making it for anyone else but myself. Whether that means it's gonna be shown some more, I don't know. Um, but I feel like one of the other things that comes with like success or being in a show or galleries, it's like, I feel like I'm constantly chasing validation that's never good enough. It's like good for 10 minutes and then the next day hits and I'm like, oh my God, now what? Everything's over. Everything's ruined. That wasn't good enough. I wasn't in this show, but I was in this show. And it's, it's silly because I feel like any success, whether it's like you give your parents a piece of art and they absolutely love it, or you sell something to a collector, I feel like they're all equal um, as long as it's bringing people joy. But I feel like in the end, my big kind of <laughs> question, like especially in this time that we're living in is like, will my art lead to any form of change? Like it'd be great to have notoriety and monetary success, but like the art world is very, I don't know, it's, it's not a welcoming place. Um, and I'd love for that to change, but also like, are people actually listening to the message within my art, talking about uh, preserving queer spaces, talking about climate change and we are in it there's no going back like i feel like everyone's like oh we have a few more years and it's like we don't like look what's happening in yellowstone right now massive flooding unprecedented flooding uh where the park has completely shut down to the public um but that's just like one teeny little thing but you know asking that question at the end of the day like will my art have an impact and what does that change look like and will that ever happen Uh, I agree with a lot of that. <laughs> and um, I want to add that uh, so being a, like an art teacher and then also doing my own art at home, um, 
during the pandemic. So when we weren't in school from, you know, March to August of 2020, I got a little taste of what it felt like to be a full-time artist because let's be honest, I did not really do anything for work at that time. Uh, Cause all we had to do was submit like one lesson for everyone like once a week. And so I made videos for that, but anyway. Um, so yeah, I got a taste of that and I really liked it. And I did a lot of commissions. So I kind of have the opposite of, of what you just said where I like to make art for other people specifically. Where like I make it and I'm like, yeah. And then I'm like, all right, bye. And I like give it away, you know? Well, I don't give it away, but like I give it to the person it was meant for. Um, uh, anyway, so I really enjoyed that. I hope that I can continue to enjoy teaching, um, especially at the elementary level because I really like how resilient the kids are. Um, uh, and Alex, should I, should I mention? Yeah, so I taught Alex's daughter in uh, third and fifth grade, I think. Maybe fourth too, I can't remember. Uh, but I actually taught Zoe um, anyway. And so uh, this, that was fun. And uh, I forgot where I was going with this. Uh, hang on just a second. Where was I going with this? Oh yeah. So if I can continue to teach and, and enjoy that, because I like the social aspect of it and like introducing the kids to all kinds of random art things, some of which they remember and some of which they really don't know what I'm talking about and they probably won't remember it. Um, and then retire and maybe become a full-time artist. So, I mean, I'm kind of content with that at the moment. So that idea. Hey friends, can I just say out loud, it's okay to want money. It's okay to want to make money at your art. It's not a bad thing. It's okay. This is what you're trained to do. This is what you're called to do. And it's okay to want that to be a monetizing career that fulfills your life. And it should be. I mean, obviously I have a huge bias about art people and artists getting paid, but I believe that artists should be paid. They should be paid well, and they should have space to be able to rest their brain and come back, not after working six jobs, but come back to their art space and make more as their, as a living. And I, I just have a really strong belief about it. I guess the only other thing I want to like just add in because I heard something, Jenny, you said something that made sense to me. I, it took me a long time to really appreciate my own art. Like I do something and be like, yeah, that's fine. It's over <laughs> and move on. I came to a place where I had to sit myself down and have stern talking to to be like remember you have to respect and like the process respect and like the entire process and walk away appreciating what you did whether like it worked for somebody else or not did it work for me did it make my spirit full and if it did then that's that's enough for me everybody else's emotions in the world of art making are not my responsibility my responsibility is just to put the work out there. I want to piggyback off of that. Like, I think the, the struggle is of like looking at the art and the commodification of art is sometimes it creates this sometimes sterile art where you're making something for someone else or you're making something that's not true to your values. Like, and you know, a lot of times we're just, we're not artists, we're mechanics. Like, you know, Walter Benjamin with like art and the, uh, mechanical reproduction and how we are just robots create doing the line work and doing all these things with no emotion and I guess for me it's that like battle like where is it how much of myself am I going to put in this and how much of it is this just a gig and those are like that balance is really hard as an artist yeah I, I would definitely agree with Maxi on that like I've been doing commissions for 15 years now and the f it's I've reached a point now where if I hate your idea I don't care how much you pay me I will not paint what you want if I hate your idea I I have made paintings and they paid me and I hated every single second I was working on that painting and then I finished it and I was like oh thank you sweet Jesus and then the very next painting was something that I wanted to make and there was such like blatant like joy just pouring out of me and I was like oh my god I forgot like what happiness what enjoying painting felt like I haven't felt that for two years and can I say those roller skates were fucking amazing so <laughs> I like, I just, I can't, I can't do it anymore. Like I will still do commissions, but the customer has to be willing to 
want, they have to want something that I already want to make. And I know that that's a privilege. I'm absolutely aware that that's a privilege. Um, but I did a lot of paintings for, uh, of a lot of stuff that I really did not want to make because, you know, I, I needed to make a hundred bucks or, or 200 bucks. Um, I straight up painted a Disney castle once and now I, I just like, oh God, I feel so cheap. I like, it's like um, but you know, no, we all start somewhere, right? That's what I tell myself. Um, yeah, fulfillment, I guess at this point now is enjoying what I'm creating and fulfillment now is enjoying uh, making spaces and making a difference in other people's lives. And um, so that's why I'm struggling now is because I've purposefully stepped back from making a difference in other people's lives through Rimtug. And so I'm feeling really guilty about that. And just, I'm feeling guilty and in investing my time only predominantly in myself and my art. That's, that's just me. I'm gonna stop now. Insecurities, what? Artist, what? Okay, bye. Can I add one little tidbit? Um, so I really enjoy what everybody's been saying. There's one thing I forgot in my spiel, and that's it's really important to talk about your failure and your rejections, because uh, I feel like that's a super taboo topic. Also, uh, price transparency as well within the art community. I feel like it doesn't happen. I've found that talking about my rejections, like all the things I get rejected, I would say I get rejected from about 98 percent of the things I apply to um, or like my work doesn't sell or whatever um, but I've started talking about that on my Instagram like I'll post my rejection letters I'll collect them and post them as bunches and I know that's probably not like the best thing to do but it happens and some of them are pretty funny the way they're worded it's very like form letter but it's very much a part of being an artist is being told no a lot um, and then having to find the energy to make work after that. Um, yeah. Well, thank you everyone. Um, any last thoughts before we move on to our second to last question? Great, um, so moving on to what does your support system look like when it comes to your art and career? Are the people in your life supportive of you as an artist? Yes. Yes is the answer. <laughs> I, I have a husband who has a brain that is 110% different than mine. His is full of data and mine is full of feelings. And, <laughs> right, yeah. and it's a perfect like symbiotic relationship. Um, but my family is supportive. My late father was very supportive. Um, my friends are all very supportive. And it's, I feel very lucky about that because I make stuff that can be tricky and I make stuff that pushes boundaries and I just heard that that person who won a, the Tony Award say keep making the weird art and I'm like that's what I do for a living I make the weird art and I produce it and I celebrate it and I have such pride in that that I feel every day grateful that there's a community of people that are like-minded that are also like, yeah, I'm going to take those risks and push those boundaries. And if people don't like it, like I said, it's not my response. Your feelings are not my responsibility. If people walk up to me and they have and went, I really hated that. Then I just go, well, great. I win because I made you feel something. So, but yes, deeply supported. Yeah, I feel, I feel really lucky. I have a super supportive partner who also has nothing to do with any sort of form of art period, um, which is actually really great because they're the first person I've ever dated who's not an artist. And oh my God, love it, truly love it. <laughs> like there's no butting heads of any uh, kind, but I feel very fortunate about that. Also, I have a family that's just been so supportive of my art career since the minute I was born, the minute they saw like I could make a scribble really well and made sure I went on like an art path. Um, also, I've gotten a ton of support from my grandma. She was the one who taught me how to sew and therefore completely changed my life. Um, 
everything I do, I feel like funnels right back into the love she gave when I was learning how to like do fun little silly crafts with her, but it's literally what I do right now and it brings me a lot of joy. I'll go, okay. Um, uh, yeah, I feel like my family is very supportive. My friend's very supportive. Alex is one of my friends that is kind of like, not well, welcomed me into the art community about, I don't know, five, six years ago. Um, seven ooh. <laughs> um, my mom and dad are really supportive they don't always understand exactly what I'm making art about minus the pet portraits they understand that um, it's pretty straightforward um, but they always they've always been very positive about it and very um, like you said Janie um, about uh, you know making art as a young child uh, and then just kind of like letting me do my thing and letting me go to art school. Although I went to Webster, so it wasn't just art school as they like to say. Um, but uh, yeah, so I feel like I have a really good support system and my friends here, uh, my coworkers at work, not everybody always knows what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, but they love to hear about it and see it. And to me, that is really what I need. So, and you know, just that support in general. Um, so, um, my art is kind of less separable to my identity as others. Um, I guess growing up in high school, I got kicked out for being a drag queen at my house. Um, and so I had to find like that support group elsewhere. And it was definitely in the club scene with my drag mom. Um, since I got on like a reality television show, I think my support group is just like huge. You know, I've thousands of people all over the world that will, they will let me know if my hair looks wrong and Reddit sub and subreddit, or, you know, if I do something out of line, um, I kind of have that there. So kind of like my fan base or like the internet is kind of like my super ego, just like um, making sure that I don't mess up or making sure that like I have to stay on the right trajectory. Um, it's sometimes really anxiety inducing um, but I think that it kind of keeps me in check. Um, it's, it's, I don't know if it really um, uplifts me at times, but I do get messages sometimes from like kids, like from the middle of nowhere, they're like 14 years old. And like, I just learned about non-binary and I'm non-binary. Thank you so much for being on TV and talking about your identity or like um, folks reach out to me like, oh, I'm suicidal. Um, and like having you talk about your story really helped me. Um, and I have other people just like ask me like, hey, my kid is trans and they don't know where to go. They need resources. And, you know, being that like, I don't want to say beacon because that seems like self like congratulatory, but being the liaison for those like instances is really, like, I feel like it gives me purpose and it makes me like say, okay, well, I have to do it for these folks. And uh, maybe there's some like altruistic egoism in there, but I, th I do think that it's just necessary to like be that, I don't know, self-propelling thing to like make sure that like I can still liaison on for other people. Okay, I'm done. Um, so time for the pity party. <laughs> um, my parents were not supportive of my art career. Um, they... My, funnily enough though, my, my dad's sister was a very successful artist and sculptor. And so was my mom's sister. So both of my parents had siblings, sisters who were artists. And maybe that's why they didn't want me to be an artist. I don't know. But um, my, my mother did not want me uh, even using crayons or colored pencils. Um, whenever my parents were, I was 19 years old, they went on vacation and left me home alone for the first time. And in an act of defiance, I made a watercolor painting in the middle of my mother's living room rug, just because I knew it would like terrify her. Um, and of course she never found out and it's great. And I still have that painting. Um, <laughs> so no, my parents were never, they were not supportive of my art. Um, and they did not want me to go to college for art. They made me come home from college. They made me, they made me drop out because I was 
you know, pursuing a, a, a my, my college education in art. Um, so, but now that I'm successful, they brag about me to all of their friends and, you know, talk about how proud they are and how much, you know, blah, 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 blah. And like, that's really rough for me to be like, mm, where were you then? That would have been great. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, I'm a little bitter. I'm a little bitter about it. Um, but my support structure now, uh, my husband's a computer software engineer. Um, so not an artist, but he is a very creative person and very artistic. Um, he's actually really good. Like he can paint and draw just as well as me. And our daughter is also very creative and artistically minded and has aspirations of going to the Chicago Art Institute. Um, but within my social circle, all of all of my friends are either trans and queer or artists. That's my life. That's my world. Um, and I've, I always have to mention that there were people when, you know, 10, 15 years ago who took me under their wing. Um, Craig Downs is a local artist who absolutely taught me how to do art installation. And John Salazzo is a friend of mine who I think of as my mentor. Um, and there are people now in my life who think of me as their mentor. Uh, Taylor Cheatham is one of my best friends and I love him on a molecular level and I'm so proud of him. And I've kind of taken him under my wing, done everything I can to help him succeed. And I kind of do that for a lot of people here in St. Louis. Uh, whenever I meet a young artist that I'm like, hey, you've got something, let's get coffee. And like, I'm like, bring a notebook. And so we sit down and I'm like, okay, you need to go to this gallery and this gallery, you need to apply to this show and this. So you need to stay away from this people because they're transphobic as fuck. Like I, I do what I can to like spread the love and spread the, the you know, like, I want other people to succeed um, because I feel like paying it forward is what art should be about. Um, and then I would say like the last support structure, and this is kind of cheesy, but whatever. Um, I'm a volunteer art therapist with an organization called Arts is Healing. So I have a group of like 50 little old women who either have cancer or other chronic illnesses who like are my tiny little cheerleaders. And they've all learned how to use my pronouns and they've all learned so much about what it is to be trans and queer. And they're all so fiercely supportive. It's like I have all these little like grandmas and, and aunts and they all like love me and support me so fiercely. Um, and it feels good that I can love and support them as they're going through chemo or, you know, struggling to find out whether or not they have a brain tumor or if that, you know, that tumor or, or cyst is benign or, um, so I have such a wonderful support structure now. And I think the reason I've always been so, um, passionate about activism and social change is that because I didn't. I didn't have that as a child. I did not have support as a child. And so it's what moves me to want to be a force of good for other people. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for sharing. Um, we have our final question. Um, and that is a very, very open-ended question. Um, and it's one that I love asking for these panels. I ask it every single panel. Every other question is unique for each panel, but this one I ask every single time. Um, and I love all the different answers I get. Um, and that is, what is the goal with creating art? And is there one? Okay, so I'm gonna just bring us into the Jean Baudrillard with the simulacra and simulation. It talks about boring stuff. Um, <laughs> well, it talks about kind of how like, how we use symbols to represent things. And I feel like that is what art is, seeking symbols and our ideas and trying to translate images and being that liaison through like whatever craft that we have. Um, it's a really good book. It's really confusing. Um, I would really check it out. Um, and I think that's what the goal is, is to kind of take, take symbols and make them to messages. And that's, that's what it is for me. I feel, I don't know why I feel so stumped about this question. 
<laughs> um, I feel like, especially after the, the ramble that I went on about how art is basically making me miserable. Um, I do enjoy it, I swear, I promise. Um, I don't know, I feel like for me, one of the big reasons why I make my art is so I can make art that is able to be understood by as many people as possible, no matter what your background is. Like there's something you can take away from it, whether it's like on a deep, deep, deep level or just purely surface, purely aesthetic. Like I, I strongly encourage people and this drives galleries absolutely nuts. So like, you know, you have to deal with the gallery rules, but I encourage people to touch my art. It's all made out of things you can buy at Joann's, like, I think play is really important in learning. Um, yeah, I just want to make art that's accessible on as many different levels as possible, especially financially. I do a lot of work where, I guess some people might say I undervalue myself, but as someone who doesn't have a ton of funds and there are things that I want, like I think it's important to have that as an option, um, making things that are, at easy to pay for price points or free. Um, yeah, I think collaboration is also really important and fun. I love meeting other artists and working with them and seeing how I can lend my skills to them. So that's pretty much exactly my answer to Jamie. <laughs> um, my, like literally what I wrote was the goal of creating art for me is to share fragments of my life to connect us all on a basic human level, whether that be love, pain, joy, loss, or pride. Um, like I, I want to just like grab people for just 20 seconds and, and through one of my paintings for them to just stop and connect in, with, for just that moment. Um, And then self-expression. I mean, I feel like that we all as humans need an outlet, no matter what it is, uh, to feel like we're not only voicing who we are as individualized humans, but that we're through our hobbies or sports or fishing or reading or just going to a movie, we all need outlets. Um, or else we'll go crazy. <laughs> so the, just the last thing I wanted to say, um, for anyone who is not familiar, oh no, it's backwards. It's It says art, oh, it's not backwards for you? Good, great, love it, makes, okay. It's called Art and Fear. Um, I read this book at least twice a year. If you are not familiar with this book and you are a creative of any kind, it does not have to be visual art. It can be poetry, it can be sculpture, it can be drag, it can be anything, absolutely anything where you create something. Buy this book. You can get it stupid cheap anywhere, art and fear. And it will really help you to learn and to like who you are and what you want to say and why you want to say it and why it's important that you say those things and to help you to move past your insecurities as an artist, um, to not let other people's impressions or thoughts about who you are or what you've created affect you and to be authentic to who you are and who you want to be as an artist. Um, this life, this, this life is for me all about creation and I'm an atheist. Alex, you make me laugh. Um, I also wish that you could have seen people stopping by. So at Wall Ball, just to say something here, I was next to Alex's painting, but Alex was not there for other reasons. And I so, got the COVID. Yeah, I, I just wanted you to say that. I didn't want to have to say it. I just had it too. Um, but uh, I was there painting next to Alex's painting. And then everybody, I got to hear all the comments and things of people stopping by and like, you know, talking about it and then wondering why you weren't there. And then, you know, I'm, I didn't say anything. Um, but uh, yeah, I just wish you could have seen and heard what people said about, you know, your stuff. Because 
anyway, that was great. Um, what is the goal? I think we all have maybe different goals and then we have some goals that are maybe all the same. Uh, I think that maybe for all of us, or I know for me, uh, it's really not a choice to make it. It's like part of, you know, my identity at this point. And that identity continues to change over my life so far of like what kind of art I'm making and why I'm making it. Um, but yeah, it's about just kind of getting all that out. And honestly, that's what I try to teach my students. It's like, I don't care if you're good at drawing or whatever, and like, you know, what you're, what you're good at. And like, I have limited things that I can offer them because honestly, there's some areas that I don't dive into too much, like sculpture, I should more, but it's harder for me to get a grasp on it as a teacher. Um, but uh, just trying to like, be like, you have ideas, get them out. And if you can't get them out in my classroom at some point, get them out somewhere or somehow. So I feel like that is, um, as a teacher, uh, one of my goals. And then as an artist, just like making what I want to make. And for me, making people's pets makes me happy. And um, when my cat died, I could have easily painted him again. And I decided not to. And I actually got somebody to draw him for me that I had been admiring her work on like a Facebook group. Um, I've never met this person in person. Um, but when she showed me Misha's portrait online first, I, I cried and I was like, this is what people do with my art. And I got to do it now with somebody else's art. And this is great. And I didn't have to do it. And it looks just like them. So, uh, so I was like really excited to feel like what it felt like for what I make people feel like sometimes. I've been listening to everyone and I've just been writing copious amounts of notes and wisdom. So thank you for all of that. Um, I guess I just did this in a list. So I, it, this very long life of mine, I think that art is a calling at this point. It's not going away. <laughs> I'm not going to get over it. It's just going to keep being there, which is good because it's part of what makes me who I am. Um, and it, for me, it's a very uh, positive way for me to express myself for me to help make social change that I would like to see in the world that makes the world a better place. Um, for me, it's about getting to tell stories, sad, happy, joyful, tears, pain, all of the above, joy, laughter through tears, as they say in the play Steel Magnolias. Um, it's for me about, it's forging community. It's the magic and the art of gathering people together to hear and experience uh, story whatever medium that is. Um, it's experiential for me in this chapter of my life, especially. It's a lot about laughter and trying to have people smile and laugh because I think we're, we're in such a cruddy place that laughter feels important to me right now, like a lifeblood that we all could use. Um, thank you for saying you don't have to be good because I think I, I've said it to a million people, you don't have to be good, just do it. Oh, I can't do that. Yes, you can. Just do it. Figure it out. And if you don't think you're good at it, just keep trying. Keep experimenting. Keep seeing. You don't have to be good. You don't have to be good. But you do have to give yourself permission to try. And I guess the thing that I'd like to just finish with is my very dear friend, Anna Pascasco, the late, great Anna Pascasco. Do you ever see the movie Save the Last Dance? There's a ballet scene in it, and she is the ballet teacher in it. And we talked together, and we were friends for years and she was in her last chapter of life um and she knew it was not a surprise and i went to visit her the last time and i said okay so we're at the end we won't see each other again and she said no you won't we won't see each other again and i said what can you share with me what's the last piece of wisdom and she said about your art always be gracious always be humble and always be proud that their words to live by. Well, thank you everyone for sharing. Any final thoughts on this question or any other questions that we had, anything that you didn't get to say that you'd like to? Seems to me like we need to make a LGBT artist alliance or some kind of something. I'm just saying, like we need to make some kind of creative group where people can actually join together and like, you know, 
I'm just saying we we should we got movers and shakers and influence. Let's do this shit. <laughs> well, we have just a few minutes left. If any of our panelists have any other thoughts, um, and for our audience. Um, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat or you can put them in um, the Q&A at the bottom of the Zoom screen here. Um, we have about five more minutes um, before we hit um, our, our kind of eight o'clock point. And if there are no questions or um, you know, there are comments from our panelists, um, thank you everyone for joining us. Again, thank you to the panelists for um, your time and for your vulnerability um, and um, for everything that you volunteered here. Um, we really greatly appreciate it. Um, hopefully now um, you have some new fans and um, and now for, so I know Josie and Alex know each other, but, and Alex and Maxie, but Alex knows everyone, but for anyone that Alex hasn't met yet, <laughs> um, and for all of you who have not met, um, now you know another artist here in St. Louis. So this is always a nice way to network and see some new faces. very hopeful to me to see so many people that are artists in our community that identify and are out there making the work. And I agree with the idea of let's form some kind of place and space where we can come together and be together. Um, if, if, if you're open to it, I will go back to the fringe and we'll figure out how to do that. And I'll reach out to all of you and say, okay, let's uh, call the masses and let's come together and create a forum because I think that community is so valuable. It's so very, very valuable. Also with ARPA funding, you know, if we talk, get queer artists to say, hey, you get all this money, let's give it to the gays so they can paint some stuff. So um, since no one's typing any questions, then I wanted to take an opportunity since probably most of the people who are tuning in to watch this are probably LGBT artists. Mm -hmm. um, the Jacoby Art Center in Alton, Illinois currently has a call for art for LGBT artists. Um, the deadline is on, uh, I believe the 22nd. So uh, Jacoby Art Center and the deadline is like next, I believe, Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday. So if you, you know, feel like being brave and sharing your work with the world, um, you know, put it out there, do it. Uh, and then the other thing I wanted to say, and this is like for the long haul. So you got like a whole ass year to get your stuff together. Um, the St. Louis Artists Guild is planning another LGBT exhibition for next summer. So Maxie and I, and I believe Janie, who are you? No? Okay. Um, so Maxie and I were in the, the Artist Guild's LGBT exhibition last summer, and it's um, it was amazing. Um, so, like, if you're wanting to make something, like, big and super queer, that would definitely be the space to share it. Okay, I just want to make one little note, and it's not like whatever. Every artist guild show I've applied to, I've gotten rejected from, including the queer show. I submitted my pulse quilt for that. No. And I was like, "Well, that's what you get for uh, I don't know." So yeah. I'm gonna show you should talk. Let's talk afterwards because I would love to show your our, your pulse quilt at the Fringe Festival in August if you're open to it. That, that works for me. I have it just sitting in storage right now. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Well, for the record, Janie, I loved your work, the, your your Crocs bite, the ones you submitted for Transcending the Spectrum. I loved them. Like, they made me, like, smile and laugh and the fierceness of them. And I was like, I respected your work, like, immediately. Thank you. That's really kind. I appreciate that a lot. Um, yeah. Me too. Since I met you. Oh, I know. I feel like you were one of the first people, one of the first queer people I met in St. Louis. That was a fun day. It was. There's also a question in the thing. It says, how has the COVID pandemic affected your work? Should we answer live or type answer? Let's just do it. Oh, if we click answer live, we can just talk. <laughs> that works. 
I've gotten really cool clients because of COVID. I know that sounds terrible. Um, I did spend a lot of time like poor, really, 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 really poor because I was on tour. Um, um, I got to work with like Grinder and like producers in Paris and in Ireland creating like video content from all over the world and Brazil. And it's been really cool, like how like people adapt to um, chaos and turmoil. And so like things like Zoom really helped open doors um, where I can play music with people all over the world and make stuff. So that's me. Um, I feel like, well, COVID destroyed like every, I graduated from grad school in 2019 and I was really excited to like be an artist in St. Louis. And then COVID hit and all of my opportunities went right out the window. But because of it, I got a job at a local embroidery studio here and learned a completely new skill. I'm trained to work on an antique chain stitch embroidery machine, AKA if you're familiar at all with any sort of Western wear that has embroidery on it, I know how to do it. It's really freaking fun. If anybody wants to see me do it, I'd love to share. If anybody wants anything embroidered, please let me know. So, oh, I know, Maxi, oh, I know. So I have you on my list. I just got my own machine, so. Um, I would say it changed a lot for us. I run a festival and <laughs> it just, we, in 2020, early, like late January, early February, we were already having discussions about what we were going to do with August. And we had six plans in place. And by March, we had decided that we were going with plan number two, which was to uh, create one of the nation's first digital festivals for performing arts. And we did, and we went back to the artists and said, this is what we're gonna do. If you don't wanna do it, we'll, we'll hold you till next year. Um, think about it. 27 artists came back and said, yes, I'll do it. And we created live to Zoom experiences that were experimental and terrifying and awesome and amazing and rough and everything that you think pioneering should look like is what it looked like. There were artists that had turned walk-in closets into performance spaces in their homes that were then performing out of them. And the reach from that we had ticket sales from 37 states across the country. And well, right, and it's this really strange, like, wow, that's great. And that reach is unbelievable. But even, so yes, I mean, in all this like tragedy that's real, there were these like odd little silver linings along the way. And the other interesting thing, the, the most interesting thing to me is that there became this new medium that's still here, it's not going away. Some artists found it and were like, this is what I've been waiting for. I've been waiting for the virtual performative arts to arrive and now they're here and this is where I'm staying. And so I wanna keep trying to foster that for them. And as well as, you know, going back to what we know, which is being in gathering in, in, in mass, in theaters, et cetera, to do theater, music, poetry, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I think it COVID affected us a lot and I had, 100 million wires running through my house connecting every machine in the world to try and make this happen and i would do every piece of it over again because it really was terrifying and dynamic all at the same time well uh i know covid was rough for all of us um covid was when i figured out that i have a tear in my brain tissue um, so my cerebral spinal fluid has leaked into the cavity in my brain where my pituitary gland is supposed to be and crushed it. So for a year and a half, I didn't know what was wrong with me, but I felt like ass every day. Um, lots of doctor's appointments, uh, driving all over St. Louis. Thank God for Wash U. Uh, their endocrinology and neurology departments just they fixed me and I'm on so many pills now, so many pills. But the point is, I feel like myself again. Um, and so while I was dealing with that, um, I was 
fortunate enough to receive a, com a commission by the new SLU hospital for some brand new paintings for the new SLU hospital. Um, they wanted 24 paintings in six months and I just laughed and laughed and laughed and I said, no. And they said, how about 12? And I said, no. And they said, how about six? And I'm like, okay. And so I made six, tiny ass 12 inch paintings, which then they photographed and turned into three foot G clays. Shh, it's a secret. Um, so I, despite uh, trying to figure out what the hell was wrong with my brain, I did make six paintings for the new SLU hospital. And I, while I was working on that, I also did Art of Paws and Wobble and worked on a commission that I started two years ago. Um, so I was very busy, but also in a lot of pain and sleeping a lot and also simultaneously trying to be a good parent and partner. Um, so COVID was real rough. And now a month ago is the first time that I actually have the ability to do and paint what I want. I have absolute freedom and um, it's very exciting for me to move into this new chapter. So I, I don't know if I mentioned earlier, I have a solo art show at the On God Arts Hotel in 2024. Um, and it seems that my inspiration for this show is kind of dark and twisted. We'll see what happens. <laughs> so anyway, COVID was complicated, but good? Question mark? I just need to know now, Matthew, do you also have a cat? Because I know uh, Alex has cats. I mean, here's what I have to tell you. I have a cat. He's our oldest child, Tuxedo. Okay. And then I have a middle child, Lewis, the dog. And mm. then I have a baby named Harvey Milk, the dog. Okay, got it. Yes. We're just making sure that you were part of the cat party. Totally. The family has all been relegated to downstairs and outside so they wouldn't disrupt during this because otherwise they'd be like, uh, dad, treats please because I keep treats in my desk drawer. <laughs> Looking at the black cat and then I saw that cat yeah. and Moose is on the couch now. Um, <laughs> I wanted to say COVID to answer the question real quickly uh, was, um, was actually a good time. I mean, it was weird. Let's admit that. Um, but it was good because I started my Etsy. I had already started my Etsy, but then I like was able to actually put effort into my Etsy and start actually selling things on it. Um, and that was a really good uh, thing to start. So, yeah, I mean, it was like Alex said, very complicated, but overall it was kind of a nice like five months of me like figuring out like more of my art. So anyway, there you go. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for sharing. Um, and thank you again for your time. Thank you to our audience for their time. Um, and now you know where you can find all of our artists. Um, the event page never goes away from our website, it just becomes harder to find. Um, but all the links to your um, sites are also there um, and the links um, to your social media, Etsy shops, um, all those are on there. So keep up with these artists and keep up with each other. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for Happy Pride. This. <laughs> thank you. Thank, you so, you, thank you so much. Have yeah. a good night. Bye. Uh...